So good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending another ACAMS eMed Talk. Today's webinar is chelation, chelation therapy data review and development, uh, an inside look with Dr. Dorothy Merritt. So all attendees are encouraged to submit questions via the chat box over to the right. Uh, questions will be addressed throughout the presentation with a longer Q&A session at the end. Uh, registrants can expect to receive a recording of this presentation within two to three business days via email. Next, I, it's my pleasure to announce that we do have a chelation education special uh, currently going on. So there's going to be 20% off of the basic chelation webinars and protocol. So I'm going to go ahead and be posting that link over to the right in the chat section along with the discount promo code. So make sure that everyone here has a chance to sign up if you haven't already uh, and hurry up because it will expire on July 3rd. So that's this Friday. Mm -hmm. So next, uh, the moderator for today is Dr. Alan Green, uh, board certified family physician uh, currently in private practice at the Center for Optimum Health in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Green's practice focuses on areas such as longevity, medicine, immune enhancement and balancing detoxification and cleansing, neurotransmitter balancing, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, allergy and environmental medicine and nutrition. Uh, not only is he a past president of ACAM, but also extremely involved in everything we have going on today. So Dr. Green, it's such an honor to have you here and I'll pass it off to you. you. I know, it sounds like I'm such an underachiever, doesn't it? <laughs> um, uh, it's a, it is a, it's a pleasure to be here today too and to um, be moderating this workshop with Dorothy Merritt. Um, you know, I've known Dorothy many, many years. Um, she's a colleague and a friend um, and she has she is one of the experts in uh, chelation medicine in the United States. Um, she has been, an important member of the education team for chelation therapy that ACAM has had for uh, many years. She's served as the co-chair um, of the uh, chelation training program and on the chelation committee for ACAM. And she has appointments at universities. She really knows her chelation. And I've been doing chelation 35 years and um, and uh, and I can I still learn when I when I listen to um, I call her Dot Dot Merritt uh, Doctor Dot. So with uh, no further ado, I will now introduce you, Dorothy Merritt. Well, thank you. Let You're me welcome. get my screen get my screen up here. Okay. Um, so tonight I wanted to do um, you know a brief like. 15, 20 minutes on where we are with EDTA and the um, national TAP trials and catch you up on um, things as far as cardiovascular, um, renal, and some new um, treatment um, papers on, on treatment of neuropathies. And then I'll present a case and I have Betty presenting a case that's very interesting that um, we've done several times at the meetings. And so with that, I'll get started. So what's new with EDTA? Um, as you know, EDTA started out being a, um, the during after the First World War, they didn't have anything, they couldn't get citric acid from, um, from Germany, or Germany couldn't get it from England because they weren't friends anymore. And so they had to develop something and they developed EDTA. And it was basically to take out the white spots that calcium caused in, in dyeing clothes and, and cloth. So, but it's used in many things, lipstick, um, uh, your corn flakes, uh, water treatment plants. I mean, it's in your purple top tubes, it's in everything. There's at least 14 different um, versions that um, Dow owns, but only two are FDA, are well, are, are approved for use in humans. And so they, these different chelates, um, have different um, salts attached to them so that they work at different pHs. But for human pH in blood, we use um, calcium EDTA and disodium EDTA. So the initial report on, on EDTA chelation for coronary disease was in 1956 in a bunch of uh, lead intoxicated Detroit workers. 
And there was a serendipitous observation in patients being treated for leg toxicity that their angina went away. Now, remember, this is before CCUs, statins, probably aspirin. I mean, nobody knew anything except people dropped dead and, you know, indigestion, and which was angina. And uh, here was this uh, neat stuff that when you got treated with lead, your angina went away. And so jump ahead uh, or fa fast forward 60 years in many, 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 many studies. Um, and then you get to the, mer um, we, we uh, funded, the NIH funded the trial to assess chelation therapy, basically to prove that it didn't work. And um, Tony Lawless was the PI, I was one of the PIs on this um, plan. And finally, after 10 years of enrolling people, and it took a long time because everybody thought, you know, chelation was fraud and abuse and didn't work and it was silly and all this kind of stuff. Finally, in JAMA in 2013, this landmark study is published. And basically, uh, without getting too detailed with it, there were four arms. The top purple arm was placebo. The bottom was the green arm. There is the treatment uh, with EDTA and high dose oral vitamins. These weren't even high dose IV vitamins. They were just high dose oral. And then the yellow is um, just EDTA by itself. The little blue one is just the high dose vitamins and nothing else. And then of course, placebo was the purple. But what I'll point out on this graph is that during the first 12 months, most people received their 30 to 40 chelations, right? And you don't see much divergence of the curve in this case. And it's only at about 12 months where you see big divergence. And then over the five year period, you can see it diverges quite a bit. Well, the very interesting thing about this trial and the way statistics work is that there were more dropouts. There was 17% dropout in this trial, but it wasn't of the people getting treated. It was the people who weren't on treatment. They were on the placebo end. Most of them had had a event and they were like tired of getting poked. And they said, this isn't working. Uh, I want to get the real stuff. I mean, that, that's basically what happened. Well, statistically, when that happens, the curves come closer together. If you have a trial where people drop out at the treatment end, the curves diverge even more. So it makes it look like it's better, even though it's maybe not. So anyway, I want to point that out. Then uh, after they got the data and they started looking at the subsets of people, they noticed that the diabetics diverged the most. And I mean, really diverged. And, and notice that they diverged right down there from day one. And anybody who does chelation notices that in diabetics, they they get the biggest bang for their buck and it happens immediately. Well, okay, so the bottom line on this study, I could go on and on, but the bottom line is, and this is one of the things I put in my rooms, is if you look at EDTA reduced cardiovascular events, it was 18%. If you looked at EDTA with the high dose vitamins, it was 26% reduction in events. And that is on top of all these people had to be on optimal medical therapy. So they had to be on their five, five uh, drug post heart attack, you know, uh, regimen. And, and look at the NNTs, you know, number needed to treat. I'll show you where that's really important in a minute. But um, if you look at the diabetics and you get down there to number six, which is the EDTA plus high dose vitamins, reduced MIs by 51% over the five year period compared to people that were treated with placebo. And the number needed to treat was only six. So you take six diabetics who are post MI and you treat them and you have a 51% reduction in uh, heart attacks and 43% reduction in CV mortality, 41% CV total events. But these NNTs are insane. You just don't get those kind of, and, and here's, here's the, the slide I laminate and I have in all my exam rooms. It's the five, you know, post the optimal medical therapy of aspirin, beta blocker, statin, ACE, and then the chelation. And if you look at that, with the 26% reduction at a trial level A, and you compare it to all the others, look at the NNTs on these other things, the ACEs, the STANs, you know, they're 33 to 65, 28, 42. I mean, they're huge. And here we have something that if you get the real deal and you're a diabetic and you take the high dose vitamins, you have an NNT of six. Unbelievable. And so, you would think, you know, with that kind of data, everybody would be real excited, but you should have seen the ACC meeting where they announced the preliminary data. And I've never seen so much uh, temper tantrums and, and just absolute disbelief. We must have cheated. You know, it was, it was just really amazing. Here we have an incredible trial, 55,000 
um, IV drips were given. 55,000 with nothing like this ever before. Anyway, so because of all that, it took them two years, but the ACC granted chelation now promoted it from class three, which means probably doesn't work, for, to a class 2B, which is, well, the usefulness is uncertain, but it might work. So we're all the way up to that after that huge trial. So the FDA said, do another trial, but this time do it just in diabetics. So TAC2 started in 16, and they had, uh, as of uh, September of last year, they had almost 800 people randomized, and then of course it closed down because of COVID for the last three months. But they're probably up to over 800, 850 now, and this is also a five-year trial, and it's focusing on the diabetics. So this time it was like, well, we can't recommend a, a treatment that we don't know how it works. So how is this working? Well. Of course, people who've been studying EDTA for years knew that it removed metals, it reduced inflammation, and it, um, it did something with nitric oxide. I mean, huge, huge something. And you know your diabetics are really poor in nitric oxide, so that's why I think their curve, and I'll show you why in a little bit, why their curve widened right at the beginning because they were the sickest as far as the... Um, the um, nitric oxide and then you know by removing the metals over that year you allow basically like the hairball in the drain in your metabolic system to, to dissolve and then all of a sudden you can start fixing things and so that's when you really see the um, benefit is at well in, in all comers in diabetics you see it immediately this if you're interested um, website is tech2.org and these are the sites right now in the United States. And you can see that um, uh, the diabetic belt uh, and the heavy metal belt over in the, um, uh, the Northwest corridor all the way down to the south, Southeast um, corridor is, is where the majority of diabetics are. So this is gonna be a good trial. There'll be lots of uh, appropriate people. So if you're interested in participating or you, um, just want to refer people you can go to the site and get get the information so what they did with um the tac2 before they started they did this little poster where they basically took all these people who were appropriate who would you know who could sign up and be part of this trial and they did a chelation um challenge on them and basically measured their urine before and after um chelation and so what they, they saw was almost a 4,000% increase. Dr. Merritt, in real, real quick, sorry to interrupt you. Could you go back to your web browser? There's a little white window at the bottom of your web browser and we can't see the... the, the yeah, and I don't know, that's that's that, this is the... Just hit that hide, the hide, button. yep. Okay, there we go. You, okay, well, that yeah. was the, that was the, okay, anyway. Perfect, yeah. 4,000, almost, you know, 4,000% lead excretion post EDTA on a first treatment. 670% on cadmium, we'll know that that's CAD and PVD right there. And then if you go over to the far right, you can see where um, the, um, it's the far, far right curve, by 20, um, by 20 um, chelations, the, the amount of um, lead was really down. That's actually the wrong graph. But anyway, the amount of lead was incredibly down just by 20 treatments. But of course, they were all given 40. And so there was also aluminum and um, nickel and and um, I don't know if that's thallium or titanium, but anyway, um, a lot. But lead and cadmium are the elephants in the room. And so so now we know that you know we're proving one of the um, things in TAC two is everybody's getting their you know post excretion um, metals measured. So we'll and we already know that. Uh, Cranton published something way back in his textbook from the 1980s that was updated, I think, in the 90s, um, that nor in, in normal people presenting for chelation, the amount of lead was eight times higher post-challenge. So that would be 800%. But these people are 38. They're almost 4,000% increased lead excretion. So I think it's going to be very interesting when they show, uh, you know, the metal... Uh, metal arrangement here. Okay, so let's see. So um, this is back on TACT-1, and so this is the patients that had coronary disease and PVD, 
And what they're, I, my name is on this publication, so that's why I'm showing it, but anyway, no. But anyway, the sicker they are, the better, the, the wider that curve was, you know, as far as how fast it differentiated. And the actual reduction in events in these people was 58% reduction. So pretty, pretty impressive for a cheap little generic uh, medication. So now TAC3 is coming. So they, they decided to start looking at critical limb um, cases. And so this is a case that I think they won some big thing on with the uh, FCC. Anyway, um, this guy comes in, you can see the baseline purple toes. He failed a re, re uh, you know, vis um, vascularization procedure. And this is his toes up through 41. And yes, the necrotic ones are amputated off or auto amputate. But look, he has no more pain, can walk, has good quality of life at this point. The uh, lower extremity angiograms, you can see where it just cuts off at, you know, above the ankle there. And then down at the bottom, the um, post infusion posterior tibial artery, uh, arterial duplex, you can see where there's huge improvements in blood flow after the 41 treatments. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and uh, it, so now 3A has started. And they've published the first seven people that they've done and um, lovely toes there. But again, uh, they, they reported in different ways, but it's about 4,000% increase also in the, um, the amount of um, lead and cadmium. And that's what they mostly focused on this one. And you can see that um, the post chelation levels of urinary lead in that middle slide on the far right, they start from baseline and by, by infusion 20, you're not gonna find high levels anymore. They're gonna be, but they're gonna be continuously coming out of the bone storage area. So, um, so they don't stop it at 20, they will go for the 40 treatments. Um, so if you look at the million CBD deaths prevented in 2010 compared to 1968 in the US, you see a 32% decrease in cardiovascular disease. And they think, I'm sorry, it's a 46% reduction total of cardiovascular disease starting from that peak. And then now it's down to 2010. And they think a third of that is due to the decreased amounts of lead and, and cadmium in the environment, just from that alone. Um, and to prove that, they've got 37 unique studies and quite a few number of people. And they have, uh, this is an NHANES study, and, and they've looked at all the different um, um, statistical things. And so the rates in the U.S. decreased 43%. And uh, a third of that is basically the reduction in cardiovascular mortality could be explained by the decline in lead and cadmium. So there, we definitely have lots of good epidemiological um, uh, data that lead and cadmium and cardiovascular disease are related. Now, where do we get lead in the 21st century? Well. You know, normally you get it from forest fires and, and, and volcanic eruptions and spray of rock that has lead in it. And, you know, so it's very small amount. But then if I'm um, up to like 1975, they were putting in 273 times 10 to the six tons of lead just from gas in the environment. OK, and, and, and paint had some to do with it, but it's mostly gas. So during 1980 to 2012, there was a 91% reduction of lead in the environment. So you can see over to the far right, the lead levels in the United States have gone down. And in fact, right now, they're um, between one and two is the average for adults. Um, so it's not the uh, 14 that it was in the 19, mid 1970s and probably even higher in the 50s. Now, of course, occasionally lead falls out of the sky and in ways we didn't imagine when Notre Dame um, had that fire that burned the roof off. Well, 400 tons of lead rained down on Paris. And so they were 13 times higher than, this, than the French safety guidelines. And it, in, 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 in a half mile or so, in a mile, they have, if I had this on, um, where it was on demo mode, it would show the a, the area around Notre Dame and, and how high the lead levels. But more than 6,000 
children younger than six lived within a half a mile of this location. So it was a disaster from a lead point of view. Okay, let's see. All right, um, and then we have the sequela of the lead from the industrial age. Uh, you can look at the with that red stuff up in the northwest. You want to plant something or have your cows eat something there. I mean, the lead levels in the soil are just um, unbelievable. And you can see Colorado has it. That's probably Leadville and all the mines. And down in the southwest, that's probably all you know the the, the mines and stuff. But we have a lot of industrial lead that's still left over and in the soil waiting to um, approach us. And in fact, um, they've looked at water contamination and urban soil runoff and basically east coast, west coast. If you look at Oakland, it's 100 parts per million and Philadelphia is 400 parts per million. And Boston Gardens had over 400 parts per million. That's where everybody goes. They have the community gardens where everybody goes and raises their food. And when Michelle Obama had her kids garden, you know, for the eating rights stuff, they had to add um, um, grand ground uh, crab shells which bind up the lead to help neutralize the toxicity so um well, that's still a problem we have to go with but sometimes the biggest problems are the simplest solutions well it turns out lead binds to your bone right i mean we'll get to that in a minute but it does it binds to appetite and it becomes part of the bone where calcium is so they ground up um uh, fish bones and made these big sacks of 100 pound bags and, and they detoxed uh, Oakland and New Orleans had published papers where they detoxed uh, toxic sites. And because if you put so much this per square foot of topsoil, you can lower the lead from 0.28 to 0 0.00085 like in a couple weeks. Unbelievable. And the thing about it, they do it on playgrounds uh, too, because the thing is, is Kids play in playgrounds and get all that dust and it's full of lead, but it turns out fish appetite's not absorbable. So if lead is bound to fish appetite and the kid gets lead, you know, lead in the in the dust that's bound to the appetite, it, it, it just goes through them. It doesn't hurt them. So that's a pretty interesting uh, solution. It's so cheap and easy. So let's just go back to blood levels. Uh, there's blood lead levels and bone lead levels. And the Blood lead levels are at the tip of the iceberg. If you're back in the you know 70s and the average blood lead level of an adult in the United States was 14, okay, well that reflects the last 30 to 60 days of exposure, and half of it comes from your bone and half of it comes from the environment, unless you're pregnant, and then 80% of it comes from your blood lead level or it comes from your bone storage. So most of the CDC NHANE studies that you read are talking about blood lead levels, okay. And that's what we measure, that's the standard now is blood lead levels. Bone lead levels are the iceberg, okay? Not the tip of it, they're the whole iceberg. Here's the, here's this quick and easy thing to remember. If you breathe lead in the air or get it ingested somehow, 50% 50, uh, 50 of the stuff in the air goes into your um, body and is absorbed and goes to the bloodstream. 90% of that, settles in your bones over the next 90, uh, 60 days or so. So what we have is a bunch of us running around that were born before 1980 that are full of lead. And our bones have like 400,000 times more lead than pre-metal man does. I mean, it's it's that, it, and, and, and then what the really bad part is, is that when you start turning age 40 you and normal normal aging normative aging happens and hormones change what happens is you dump out four to ten times faster so your bone storage is turning over releasing all that lead and now guess what you don't breathe it in your paint and you don't breathe it in your gas but now you have your own body trying to uh, do you in because it's dumping all this lead and so if you go through chemo or have hyper thyroidism or have anything that's catabolic, you know how people get one thing and then they get 10? Well, that's what happens. You just start dumping out so much lead um, that you become very toxic very quick. Now, the first, land, and this was a landmark article, was published in 2006. And before that, everybody thought anything below 10 was, you know, okay. And, and toxicity wasn't you know, even close to that. So, well, what they, this was the first one that looked at the NHANES data in adults in America, and it was about 15,000 people throughout America. 
in the um, late 90s. And what they showed was, and this sounded bad at the time, but there was a 25% in all cause mortality, 55% in CV mortality, uh, 89% in MI mortality and stroke went up 151% in people that were in the um, top fertile. But here's the thing, the turtiles were so tight then, it was like if you were under like 1.8 and then it was like 1.8 to 3.2 and then 3.2, well, whose blood lead level even goes, I mean, Quest doesn't even go, at the time they didn't even go down to three. I mean, they went down to three or four and LabCorp who used atomic uh, numbers, um, they would go down, they would go down to one. So, and of course then there's error, but anyway, the bottom line is that at this point, they were measuring lead levels that were so small, nobody had any idea that they had this kind of vascular effect. Well, remember the bone lead is, is, is the iceberg, it's even worse, and so they made a bone density machine that measured lead. And there's about 13 of them in the United States because we should have them on every corner and checking who, who really is at risk, whose bones are at risk, but anyway. And they found it was 837% increase when adjusted for age and smoking in people that were in the top tertile of bone lead. So the more lead you've been exposed to, the more you have problems. And this, the real killer was last year, or I guess it was now it's been two years, when they published the extension study of that NHANE study. Um, and all of a sudden, all-cause mortality went from 25% to 137% adjusted. CV mortality was, uh, ridiculous 170 percent scheming mortality 208 and so but what they did is they used a lot of interesting statistics and of all cause mortality 18 percent of the population that dies per year which and that year was 412,000 people was attributed to lead not cholesterol not hypertension not all these other risk factors but to lead so this is another land i mean this is a a landmark on top of a landmark, okay? And they they figure and through their statistical stuff, they figured you know 28 to 38 percent of CV and ischemic mortality are directly attributable to lead. So of the uh, the tw almost 20 year follow up of these 14,000 people, about a third of them have already died, and 18 percent of that was um, from lead. And if you think about that, that was 2.3. Now we have and I don't know what's happened in the last 10 years, but now we have 2.8 million people who die a year, which is about 7,778 people a day die. So we, you know, that number of people die anyway, but 18% of that is due to lead. Um, this is other stuff that the NIH trials, which was a bone, they were the normative aging and they, they used the bone density machine 44% of cataracts, people who lose a bunch of teeth, I think it was eight, people with osteoporosis, people with PVD, CAD, gout, uh, brain shrinkage on MRI, renal insufficiency, how fast you could walk, and 10 other you know, parameters that they've looked at were all um, found to be higher in the higher tertile of lead. But they've published studies for about 20 years and there's, there's hundreds of studies. So my case that I wanted to present tonight is this guy who was a construction company head and his brothers had all had problems in their um, 50s with heart disease, but he was fine, didn't have any problem, but he had a lot of lead exposure in his occupation. So anyway, he went to cardiologist and said he wanted to you know, be cast and they laughed at him and said, well, we'll do a stress test, but you don't have anything wrong with you. And so um, other than the fam family history, he talked him into the stress test, which I'll show you in a minute. It was positive. Cath showed a 50% lesion with distal um, narrow lesion. And he presented to me, he wanted sodium EDTA. And um, so I collected um, serial leads after each 15 treatments, which was my protocol at the time. His cardiologist put him on a statin, aspirin, and ACE. This was his initial um, stress test, which he brought me. And very nice, you notice the little arrows he brought already plugged, the little tape already on the um, <laughs> on the thing in case I didn't know where that black line was supposed to be. And then um, this was his cath uh, with the 50% block and then the d narrow distal thing. And then this is his, um, 
six or six or eight months later, they did another stress test on them, and all they're nice big red donuts. There's no ischemic areas at all. So he was my interesting uh, case, uh, and I, I showed that as I brought down the lead. You know, the lead came down as expected. Now there was, um, I want to show you a couple slides because so we've got the we've got the the um, EDTA and vascular disease, right? Now this was a famous I mean, set of, he must have published like eight papers. And he's uh, out of Taiwan where they have a high um, baseline lead levels. Um, and so he took people who had decreased creatinines but didn't have diabetes, right? And as you can see on the graph, he watches them for two years and watches their creatinine go down, randomized but not treated. And then boom, the group that's been randomized to treatment, you see what happens, they're the ones on top there. They're, um, Glomerular filtration doesn't go completely back to normal, but it it and, and it bursts up just like in a month. You can see this incredible improvement in their renal um, perfusion, and they go down at a very low rate over the next couple of years. The rest of them will go on toward dialysis or to um, um, dialysis. And so these at the time, these were people that had um, low level twenty four hour urines. Um, so they had elevated body burden, but they weren't EP or um, uh, toxic by you know the the different definitions. Definition at that time was 600 units, and I've only seen that um, in one person in all my 25 years or 20 years of doing this. But, so these were people that were greater than 80 but less than 600, and they received treatments. And when their lead levels would start going back up or their urine lead levels, they'd start chelating them again. So these people were continuously intermittently chelated over two, three years. And so you can see what happened to them. And um, the New England Journal um, said at the time, they said, well, we don't know that it's due to chelation of lead, but we sure know that it's due to EDTA chelation. I mean, they were very, uh, and, and the difference in cost for the guys that are um, on that bottom row were, were, the cost of dialysis at the time was $63,000 compared to $3,300 for the years of um, chelation, I mean, actual cost. And so it was like a 95% reduction in cost of care. So, I mean, th there's a lot of interesting cost data that I see. And I think this, we know that glomerular uh, filtration works on nitric oxide. So I think this is an example, and this is using calcium EDTA, not sodium. And I personally am not, I don't believe there's a big difference. So the bottom line is um, this was calcium EDTA and it caused a lot of improvement in glomerular filtration through nitric oxide. Now he went ahead and published this seven more times or seven or eight more times. And so, you know, I think we have plenty of uh, data now showing that EDTA treatment not only slows CKD progression and it may not even be related to directly to lead, but here's the, um, Oh, I'm missing a slide, Val. I guess I'll show that slide later. And then this was that paper that um, where neurotoxicity and treatment with EDTA and a lot of different things that are direct neurotoxins, okay, beside metals, and then indirect agents that cause cytokine or ROS species production, and then um, the ones that develop the, oh gosh, what is it? Um, it's the lymphocyte 19 or 17. Um, uh, species of T cell that then cause allergies and cause metal um, allergies through immunotherapy. So now there's 21 metals that are considered toxic. They're listed there. The ones highlighted are the most uh, related to, um, I believe, cardiovascular or to um, to uh, uh, neurotoxicity. So we talk about toxic metal burden, and we know it's been proven already in, in, in MS and a lot of different neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, that if you look at the toxic metal burden, um, it's much higher in those with neuro neurological disease than people that are um, healthy controls. And so there's a really good article, it's recent, and it has um, a lot of, um, uh, this one and the one before have a lot of, um, uh, up-to-date references. So basically they're saying that if you eliminate toxins, if you correct your lifestyle, um, and then you get rid of these um, metals um, 
with chelation, you have an excellent option to ameliorate symptoms of a neurotoxicity. And, and whether it's metal-induced um, for cardiovascular or whether it's neurological or whether it's kidney, here's what happens. You have redox, you have increased production of um, cytokines and, and decreased nitric oxide, and then those cause the oxidation, the endothelial injury, the vasoconstriction, all the things that we see in heart disease. So there's no reason that EDTA, will, I mean, the EDTA has been proven to work on all these different things. And so it's a good choice when you've got these broad degenerative diseases like cardiovascular and neurogenetic degenerative diseases to, to hit it with, a, you know, a little bit of EDTA. All right, and so this is the nitric oxide mechanism, um, directly, direct correlation between um, nitric oxide and, um, and uh, lead levels. So the higher the lead levels, the lower the nitric oxide. And then this is the study I like, because this is what I want pushed into me if I ever go into surgery. Um, these rats, these lead-free rats, were um, treated with EDTA 30 minutes before the renal arteries were clamped. And then, of course, they didn't survive. And so it, it, their, their histochemical and functional testing was performed. So in the pretreated rats, their um, NOS expression and their nitric oxide was higher. They had decreased um, inflammatory things like TNF-alpha and MAC-1 adhesion molecules. But these had, this had nothing to do with lead. This had to do with the function of EDTA on nitric oxide. So very interesting mechanism. This is um, a study that was published, um, gosh, when was it published? Um, like around 2009. And they took uh, like eight or nine different um, EDTA uh, or um, uh, assays and did it on these people before and after, I think it was 20 treatments. And bottom line, 20% reduction in oxidation, 34% reduction in DNA damage. So a good thing for aging, no matter what it's from. So the other thing I wanna to talk to you about tonight, if we have time, is issues to consider right now. We've got all these new compounding rules and people making rules about how you can't put, so, you, can't, you personally can't put more than three things in, in some states in, in a bag. Uh, in Texas, they just don't enforce it. And then time considerations and then, there's some people that are, you know, promoting these oral and suppository forms. Well, I was going to tell you about the compounding rules. Um, if you're, they vary from state to state. It's usually three items. This is what's in the tag trial. Right now, we mix this up ourselves. But in the future, in the near future, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to have a pharmacist do it, and it'll have to be a compounding pharmacist, and it'll be a lot of extra money. I went back and talked. I actually talked to um, Elmer Cran through the e email. He's like 88 now. And he said that go back and look at his original protocols where they just used disodium EDTA adjusted to creatinine clearance and then used an isotonic solution like D5 or half normal. And then if they had pain up to 200 milligrams of lidocaine, well, that's good because that the, the, the IV solution counts as one thing. And then there's the two more. So you can get by the compounding rules if you just do this and have them take high dose oral high dose oral vitamins. So this is, this may be, I mean, this is not the ACAM protocol. This is Cran, but he was part of ACAM. And it may end up being what saves us from the, um, the um, compounding rules. I have a history in physical for lead. This got me a, um, when that 2006 article was published, I was like, okay, it, this, Lead toxicity is recognized now. I'm going to bill, and a lot of them were to Medicare patients. And I got a nice little audit from the integrity auditors um, in, in 2009, and I thought I was going to die. But anyway, I had developed this nice little heavy metal uh, for lead, and it has all the things that are in the ATSDR and the CDC and the normative aging study. And basically, I was able to document if they had a lead level over two, that it was okay to bill and it got signed off by doctors at Medicare, which is amazing. And uh, anyway, so for many years we, you know, billed and using this form. Um, then I want to mention one other guy who's probably, we all need to thank, his name is Ray Evers. He was a chelating physician in Alabama 
And he's the one that got us um, the right to use drugs that uh, once they were FDA approved for something, you could use them off label for anything you wanted to. And, and there's only one that I know of that you can't do that with, and that's growth hormone, and that's in some 1970s thing in Congress. But anyway, he won this precedent. And, um, but, you know, once they're after you, they're after you. He en ended up, he treated all degenerative diseases with chelation. But back then, they weren't as good about, you know, the doses and everything. And I think he had some se severe adverse effects, and he lost his license. But anyway, we still need to <laughs> pay homage to this man because, if it is published, if it's used anything and it's FDA approved, you have the right to use it in your in your um, practice. Now, these are just three pages. Uh, these all the, these are on tac2.org, starting from the design of the first tac trial up to all these heavy metal and environmental contaminants. These are great articles if you're bored and you just want to really dig into them. They're all there free on that site for you. And with that, I am done. All right, Dr. Green, uh, do you? Yep. yep. Well, I want to pull up your presentation, sir. Oh, oh, I think you might be muted, sir. Sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Yep. All right. So we got a, uh, a history of chelation and, <laughs> and its use in 45 minutes, that's that's great. Um, now, I, there were only, actually there were only a couple of questions um, and we have a little more time. But, but actually, because there's only um, a, a few questions, is was there anything else that you just wanted to mention that you um, maybe thought you didn't have time to bring up? Uh, yeah, no, what I'm, I'd like to do is get people, because part of the thing about chelation, part of the thing that I liked about ACAM even 20 years ago when I went for the first time was the camaraderie of the group and how we all share things. What I'd really like to do is start doing a series of these little things where we get, um, like, I want to do the next topic on retained bullets, because that's a really interesting topic. I have mm -hmm. tons of people that have been blasted, you know, with uh, 130 pellets at these hunting accidents. Hey, you know, it's Texas. But anyway, um, <laughs> and um, and they're really hard to treat because they have they won't take these pellets out. And I want to find an interventionalist um, that will you know use a little suction device and get those things out because they say that they're enclosed, but that's baloney. I've never seen anybody with less than a twelve uh, chronic mm -hmm. lead level if they have bullets. Yeah. And so I want to get you know ask the community if they'd like to you know. Do you know uh, uh, anybody who has cases like that? Let's have an evening. I'll do like a ten-minute little thing about you know the history and the bullets and extractions and blah blah blah. And then let's present some cases and what people have done because I'm telling you, I've got some really great cases and I I'm ha hamstrung on how to get the lead level down. Well, it would be good to do a, a series of of case presentations in general, not just a. You know, I mean, I'm going to do a couple quick ones here before we get to the questions. Um, um, do I click next, Jason? Is that yeah, you can just hit next at the bottom of the screen. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, so here, these are two patients. I mean, I've been doing chelation for 32 years and for a variety of reasons. Um, in this patient, um, I presented them at the at the conferences. He was an 81-year-old when he came to see me uh, with both documented coronary and peripheral vascular disease. And in, in his case, I was using the ankle brachial index, which is a, a simple uh, test where you're measuring uh, blood pressure between the upper extremity and, um, and the, the arm and the lower extremity. And uh, when you compare um, the systolic blood pressure, you can see you get a ratio, and normal is 0.9 to 1.3. Um, moderate, a mild to moderate is when it goes down, when you have uh, uh, a bigger gradient there. And then severe is less than 0.4. And so you can see before I um, treated him um, with a course of sodium EDTA, and I just gave nine treatments before we uh, tested his uh, ankle brachial index. 
And you can see that in his, uh, on his right arm, uh, on the right side, he uh, was 0.73 before and 0.98. So he was, he had moderate uh, disease um, prior to treatments and it went to normal and on the, was not quite as much on the left. But you can see here, this was a simple test, didn't require anything invasive, um, and he didn't do that many treatments um, uh, before uh, he showed clinical improvement as well as laboratory improvement. And the next case I thought uh, I'd share with here um, is uh, a patient who's still still with me. He um, came at, when I first started treating him, uh, he was 76. He had uh, both wet and dry macular degeneration. I um, did a provocative chelation challenges with him, um, both um, with, uh, let's see, I have to get rid of my picture and so I can see the results um, there. If you, thank you, yeah, good, okay. <laughs> so um, so in his uh, six hour uh, chelation urine challenge, um, he, you could see that he, uh, they, although the test measured many metals, though I only mentioned the ones here that were abnormally elevated. Um, and you can see he, he probably had a number of MRIs in his life where he was given gadolinium as a tracer. And, uh, and you can see he had a very high level, normal is less than 0.5. Um, but after 20 treatments with EDTA, um, a post treatment, a post cap challenge, they didn't, um, there was, they couldn't find any. So that was pretty amazing. And, you know, I still think there's an, uh, a dearth of knowledge about what all this gadolinium is doing in our system. I once had a patient who had one MRI 20 years prior to his uh, provocative challenge and had very high levels of gadolinium. So this tends to stick into our, in our, in our tissues. And, um, and I'm glad that finally radiologists are recognizing this and are trying to avoid using gadolinium as much as they used to. They were very cavalier about its use in the past. Here, uh, cadmium was elevated and, uh, and, and lead um, were all elevated. Um, he's, Actually, this this probably should be updated with because uh, he's had a number more of chelations over the years. He's done a lot of things with me um, in his in his care. Now on the right side, um, we also um, did um, uh, looked for mercury, and um, he he uh, through a DMPS challenge um, had elevated mercury in his urine, and um, he did a, a number of uh, DMPS treatments as well as oral DMSA three times a week, um, and and you can see that his mercury came down. So he, you know this is just evidence. His macular degeneration actually halted, and um, whereas it had been increasingly getting worse prior to the time that I, he saw me, it it quickly arrested and plateaued in its severity. And then more recently now, um, he actually has had slight improvement in his macular degeneration. So these are the two cases that I uh, have. And back to Dorothy. So I'm going to, um, uh, there was a, a question here. Let me look at the questions. Um, well, someone asked a very technical question about the, the binding uh, constants of EDTA. Of do you, do you have that at the top of your? <laughs> the... Yeah, I do. And, and in vitro and in vivo are different. Um, they're um, those those are in uh, with um, Cranton's book, and I have them as part of a presentation if somebody really wants them. But the the thing is, is it's not only the binding. PK values, it is how present it is. So something like manganese may not have a very high binding, but when you do, you'll see tons of manganese because it's, and magnesium and calcium, you'll see tons of that because it's there, okay? And there's a lot of it. 
But um, some things like you'd think would have um, better uh, binding, like mercury, don't. And so, yeah, you can't, it, the, the peak value is important, but remember that's an in vitro thing, and in, in vivo, it's it's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like one plus one doesn't always equal two. Okay, yeah, that's a, a I'm going to try to keep it a little more clinical, the questions we're going to do in the time we have left. We have 10 minutes left. Um, how long do I have to wait before getting a BMP after an IV EDTA treatment? A, a basic metabolic profile, I guess that's what he's asking. Yeah, I would wait um, three to seven days because if you have damage, it's interstitial damage, okay? And it's not going to be, you know, like the artery got severed. It's going to take a few days. And so... Um, I, I know these people that back, you know, 10, 20 years ago when they were pushing IV, you know, just doing IV pushes of the calcium. You can't do it with sodium. It'll kill somebody. But they were doing it with the calcium. But the thing is, is that the toxicity of EDTA has to do with how bad it interstitially bothers the kidneys. And so I know one guy, he's, he's treating a lead guy, you know, one of the guys that has 130 pellets in him. He does... Um, 250 milligrams of glutathione IV push after he IV pushes basically calcium. And he does it once or twice a week. And that my patient has, his, his credit hadn't bumped one bit. So I don't know all the things that protect the kidneys. You know, we know that NAC is an antioxidant that protects the kidneys against toxins. So, and I always give my patients NAC when they're chelating because it does protect their kidneys and it's also a chelator too. And, well, that's um, all, yeah, I'm using the, um, the, the uh, equation to calculate your dose of EDTA. I mean, if you uh, adjust your dose based on your kidney function, then you should be safe with that. And that's generally been, you know, there have been only maybe twice in my whole career of many tens of thousands of treatments where somebody's um, creatinine went up, had any kind of a significant bump up because of chelation. If you, and if you, it's not real tight. You know, we use that equation, but um, I've also seen people who just do it based on, because on every lab thing, now you have a GFR, right? Mm -hmm. And so they just base it, you know, if it's, CKD2, you know, you do quarter, you know, I mean, they reduce it proportionally. And that's easier than putting it into a big equation like people used to. So, someone asked, someone asked the, the question, what, what is the minimum GFR that you would, um, that would be the cutoff before you would stop doing chelation? Or not do chelation under a certain... Well, actual... okay, as an inexperienced person, probably you know, um, 25 or 30, but mm -hmm. as you get more experience, hey, they do it to dialysis patients. That's how, you, how do you think these dialysis patients got on dialysis? They were lead toxic, their kidneys cried out, and now they've done studies where you start the dialysis and you give the EDTA and it's flushing around in there and it dumps out a whole bunch of lead. And so mm -hmm. it, you're not gonna hurt a dialysis patient, right? Um, you're not going to kill their kidneys. So it's very interesting that some of the protocols that people have come up with uh, to do that. I would, you know, what I would do um, if, if they were really, really, you know, like below 20, 25%, that's where I would use the lower dose suppositories or the oral EDTA, not because of methyl binding, but because of the nitric oxide effect. And so smaller amounts that don't hurt your kidneys may help you with the nitric oxide part. And if you have bad kidneys, then that's a good yeah. compromise. Yeah, we, we call it chelation therapy, but there are other mechanisms of action, obviously, in, in, in how they work, right. these different chelating agents. Um, the, and he, here is a question. Can you discuss the efficacy of oral DMSA or suppository EDTA compared to IV, and if it can be used? You know, I obviously, um, we, we don't use DMSA and EDTA interchangeably, but I'll let you answer that question. <laughs> well, D D DMSA is a good metal binder, and it's, it's FDA approved, I think, to bind 
if the FDA approved level of in kids of 45 lead level, well, who has that anymore except paint eat chip eating kids in you know a few places. But anyway, um, you can use it. A lot, Cranton, you, I, I got a lot of my early training, you know, from, from Cranton, Colin, talking to Cranton, but, um, and, and then Cranion had a paper about you know, the day after you do EDTA and you have all this extra lead floating around, you need something to bind it up. And so I always, you know, one of the things I offer people is to take um, EDTA like three times, I'm, I'm sorry, DMSA three times a week, like 500, 250 to 500 milligrams three times a week, you know, in addition to doing the EDTA. Now, there's one paper, a friend of mine out in California, Rita Elthorpe, who's involved, who's going to become involved with ACAM2, published a paper, um, and they used EDTA, but they used it as suppositories, but they use it in a um, phospholipid long-acting delivery system, so you pop it in at night, it works for eight hours. Well, it's sitting there working for eight hours, and they, the metal that they collected on that one was... Three suppositories um, was equivalent to an IV. Now, I find that hard to believe, but they published it, and it looks legit. Yeah. I don't think the short-acting ones do that. And I don't think the oral, it's only absorbed 5%. Well, so, you know, it's also good to remember that, that, that the liver also filters the metal chelate complex, then gets into bile, and it's excreted through stool. And so it, you also want to make sure that people's bowels are working well and that, you know, they're not too constipated. Um, and and you can add, I mean, one of my questions was, you know, what do you give your patients as as supplements to, to complement chelation? Um, you know, I- I guess I, I can say that with, this isn't CME, so I can- yeah, I, when I started with um, a long time ago, and I've just stuck with them, I've tried other things, but I've gone back to them. There's a company near Boston called Pure Encapsulations, and I use their ultra nutrient because it has all the methylated Bs. All the Bs are methylated, has the max number of antioxidants, and it has about 16 herbs and spices. But I'm, I'm kidding. I mean, it has CoQ and alpha lipoic, and it has um, silmarion and, and um, turmeric and ginger and and you know it just has a whole bunch of everything that people need and it's, it's always worked for my patients and i give them that and then i give them two nac 600 milligrams a day and anything else that they need based on their disease state but that's the basic thing that way they get their methylated oh and i mm -hmm. always give them that a week before i do the challenge because i found a lot of people their methylation pathways aren't working and so they don't dump their metals, but boy, you get the methylation pathways working with support with NAC, methylfolate, and methyl B12, and whatever way you want to get it, and they dump metal like crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's my my thing. Someone um, asked if you combine chelation and ozone therapy together. A lot of people do. I. I've gone and trained. I haven't done it. I've gotten it myself. I love it. I mean, I love ozone. But in the state of Texas, they were really anti um, alternative medicine. And I'm I, when I quoted the New England Journal article in a article in a in a um, an ad, and 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 had a little star with the the thing to the New England Journal article, and and showed the graph and said these have a potential 95% reduction in costs. So there's, there's great interest from an, you know, a utilization review point of view of seeing if this works. I got a $3,000 fine in my first dink from the state board. And then they kept coming after me and coming after me until, you know, I finally joined the TAC trial, you know, cause it was like, okay, I can be a wolf in sheep's clothing here. And um, the, the, and, and the head quackbuster in the United States, because by then you had to tell who was coming after you. Um, had me going up there again, and this time it wasn't just for advertising, it was for hmm. medical you know, necessity. Hmm. And by then I had won the Medicare thing, and the tax trial was going to be published the next week, and I said, you guys, 
are going to look real bad next week. I can't tell you what's in the article, but you're going to look really bad if you find that this is not medically necessary. I'm, I, I'm going to quickly ask one more question only because it, it, it's been an hour and an hour goes by very quickly. Uh, uh, someone said that, could you quickly go over the basic frequency and duration of treatments, intervals between treatments, how many total, um, what if there okay. are interruptions? So the old ACAM protocol for um, cardiovascular was 40. And just that's what people found worked. And that's what they replicated in the trial. What's interesting is Chappelle and Chappelle and so published a paper comparing the outcomes of TAC to the outcomes of their retrospective study, and their people had an average of 58 treatments. They had almost no MI, so it wasn't just a 51% reduction, and much better by doing more treatments. That goes along with the normative aging thing that says it's all in our bones, so you can chelate it out and do 40, but in two or three years, it's going to be coming back. Yeah. My protocol for people that don't have super high levels is I do 15 now, and then I do one a month um, and, and until mm -hmm. just forever and because until their lead levels stay down because it's always going to be coming out of your bones and it's going to be coming out faster. So why not be there to stop it yeah, up? You know, when I do, when I do chelation therapy for metal, uh, when I monitor for metal overload. Uh, once we get down to what is considered normal levels, I'll, I'll tell the patient to do maintenance therapy. But mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they, they they you know they're tired of it. They just want to stop coming. And maybe two or three or four years later, they come back, and you do a provocative challenge, and you'll see sometimes the levels go, have gone up again because they they have they kind of uh, diffused out of the the darker, deeper recesses in, in the tissues. So it's it's a it is a lifelong uh, project. Well, I bought a um, a clinic when I was first starting this, and um, where the doctor had a stroke, and he he was doing it basically. His wife was running the clinic basically while he was bedridden at home. So I took over his clinic. But this clinic had been in it was the first one in Houston. It was called the McGuff Clinic, and um, it, it, it had been back since the '60s, right? And all the um, and and so the I heard stories and stories of these people who, you know, yeah, they did their 40, and then two or three years later they were back with Angin again, and then they did their 40, and then they found out that if they just came in once every month or two, then they never had another problem, they never had another procedure, they never had another stent, and it was true. And so it just at the same time that the normative aging study was coming out, and so it just dovetailed beautifully into what we know. Well, I think this is where we're going to end the webinar. Um, I want to thank you so much for preparing this, Dot, and thank for the people who attended. Um, thank you for uh, listening. And remember, you know, ACAM um, is still a wonderful organization to be a member of. And for those of you who are members, thank you for your continuing support. And for those of you who are not, check us out. Um, and uh, until the next time, take care. Thank you all.